Hey, everybody. My name is Thomas Felder. And it is my privilege and pleasure to speak to your school today about Black History Month. You know, I love Pine Forge Academy. I am a product of Christian education. I went to Northeastern Academy. And when I was going to Northeastern Academy, of course, we always loved Pine Forge. We loved the little rivalries that we had growing up. But I'm, I'm proud to say that, that Pine Forge has always been a school that we knew that stood for excellence. So I'm proud of all of you and I'm so thankful to your Dean for allowing me to come and talk to you for a little while about our history. So as we begin, let's just pray and ask the Lord to be with us. And dear Father, be with us. Watch over this presentation and watch over Pine Forge. I pray that you keep it, keep its leaders, keep the students, dear Father, and prepare us all to be ready to meet you when you come. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to talk to you this morning about our biblical truth of our roots, where we are seen in the Bible, and, and where the Bible talks about what our great contributions have been. You know, let me let me tell you that when I saw a, a movie a long time ago when I was growing up, and in this movie, it talked about Pharaoh and the children of Israel. The, the movie was Moses and the Ten Commandments. It was the old version. I saw it as a kid, and there was an actor by the name of Charlton Heston. He was a white guy, and he plays Moses in the movie. And when I watched the movie Moses and the Ten Commandments, I tried to figure out who was I going to root for? Was I going to root for the Israelites or was I going to root for the Egyptians? And when I was growing up, they told me I was Egyptian, so naturally I would root for them. But in the movie, both sides were white. Moses was white and Pharaoh was white. And the only people who had any complexion were the guys who were fanning Pharaoh. So as I grew up, I later, later on, I found out that the Egyptians were black. But guess what? So were the Israelites. And, and had I known then, I would have rooted for the Israelites because they were God's people. So I just want to give you a quick rundown of your history. So so the next time somebody tells you that you're not in the Bible, that God didn't think about you, I want you to know that they're, they're wrong and that God has always had his eye on us, right? So in the biblical truth of our roots, the first place that we find ourselves showing up is right there at the good old Garden of Eden. In a Newsweek article called The Search for Adam and Eve, it says that a black man and a black woman are the path of gene migration points directly to Africa. So this is just some scientists in Newsweek saying that all people, if they trace their history all the way back, it goes to a black man and a black woman. We call them Adam and Eve. What does the Bible say about that? The Bible says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he took one of his ribs, and he made he a woman and brought her unto man, Genesis 2, 21 and 22. God says, let us make man in our image and after, after our likeness. So man, in some way, shape, or form, physically looked like God. So let's see what, what he looked like when he came up out of the dirt. The word Adam means to be red, referring to a ruddy color of human skin. Adam was created from the earth by God. His name was Adama, Adama. That was the word for earth in Hebrew. The Bible says King David, one of Abraham's most famous descendants, was said to be a burnt skin color, and he is described as ruddy, which means that he had reddish skin. So when I heard about that, I immediately ran to my dictionary, and it said ruddy means red, so I looked up a red horse and a red cow. 
the red horse and red cow, if you can tell, is a, a color of brown, a reddish brown color. Many of you looking at this red horse and red cow, if you put your hand up to the screen like so, you'll see that you resemble, your complexion resembles the red horse or red cow. It's just a shade of brown. It's a shade of brown. Does the Bible give us any reasonable understanding of what God's physical features look like? There was a movie some time ago, and in the movie, they had Morgan Freeman playing God. I believe the movie was um, Bruce Almighty was the name of the movie. And it has a, a black man that he, he finds him in a parking lot and Morgan Freeman plays God. And in the movie, you are able to see Morgan Freeman's face and his hands. The rest of his body is covered up in the white suit. We have to presume that the rest of his body looks like his hands. Are you with me? So when I go to my Bible, I look to see if this picture is somewhat accurate. When you go to the Bible, it says in Daniel 7, 9, it says, this is Daniel speaking, as I looked, thrones were set in heaven and the ancient of days, that's the name for God the Father, takes his seat. His clothing was as white as snow and the hair of his head was white like wool. It is telling you its color and its texture. When we go to Daniel 10, 6, it says his body was like chrysolite. His face, arms, and legs look like burnished bronze. We find that in Daniel 10, 6. So when we take hair like wool, we put it with skin like bronze. And this gives you a somewhat depiction of what our heavenly father looks like. So I went to the dictionary and I wanted to look up wool. Why did they say wool? This is the definition of wool from dictionary.net. It says the soft, fine, curly hair which covers sheep and goats. It is thick and crispy, curly hair as of a Negro. Negro. This soft, curly hair of sheep and other animals, short, thick hair. The soft, curled hair of sheep and other animals, closely curled hair of Negroes. And these are the pictures that dictionary.net had when it came to wool. Look what shows up. This is the way our hair looks when it's natural, when it's natural. But when you go a little further and you look in Revelation 4.3, this is John the Revelator having a vision. And in his vision, he looks up into heaven and it says, and he sat, and he that sat, and it's upon the throne of God, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So this is John the Revelator who is writing from prison and he's writing in code. And he is telling the people what he saw in heaven when he looked up and saw God. And he compares the way he looked to a jasper stone and a sardine stone or a sardis stone. Take a look at what those look like on the screen. Put your hand up to it and see if it has any resemblance to you. Don't tell me you're not featured in this Bible. What about his body? The Bible says in Daniel 10, verses 5 and 6, it says his body also was like a barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet in color like polished brass. So there it is. His body looked like beryl. Beryl is a brown uh, crystal. And you could take a look at it. So we cover in all shades of brown. These different Bible writers who are seeing God in heaven and vision are all seeing things that look like you and I. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 to 15, John the Revelator again sees in vision Christ himself. And he says the hairs of his head were white like wool, just like his daddy. Remember we talked about what God the Father looks like? So now we're looking at his son. And it says the hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze. His daddy looked brown. 
he looked brown. And when you look at this, uh, this burnt brass over here, the Bible says it was refined in a furnace. So bronze is already brown. Now add fire to it, and it becomes a darker color of brown. Here's one of the, the statues that they have of a, a person washing Jesus' feet. And this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like, brown and brown. Let's go a little bit further back in the Bible, though. Let's just take a quick history lesson. I know we don't like history, but it's Black History Month. What do you expect? The Bible says that the world was destroyed by a flood. And a man named Noah and his three sons and their wives replenished the earth. The ancient world was destroyed by a flood because of their wickedness. And all nations were repopulated by Noah's three sons named Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And we find their lineage in Genesis chapter 10 called the Table of Nations. Let's play a little game and, and let's see if you could figure out which of those three sons you came from. We have Ham, Shem, and Japheth. You know, people often say that one was this race or that race or the other race. But I would, I would suggest to you that if, if history already tells us that these people originated in Africa and these sons come from the same mother and father, that we have no reason not to conclude that they all looked somewhat the same. So, but which of Noah's sons is the father of the Negroes? Of the Negroes, that's the question. If you look at the table of nations based on Genesis chapter 10, we find that Noah's three sons inhibited or inhabited three main different parts of the world. Japheth inhabited what is now known as Europe and his descendants, one was named Javon, one named Kittim, and one named Ashkenaz. Just if we look at those three descendants, we find that Javon is the founder of a place called Greece, Kittim is a place, is the founder of a place called Rome. And Ashkenaz is the founder of a place that we now know as Germany or Eastern Europe. When we go to Ham, uh, Noah's other son, he is the progenitor of the dark races, right? Ham means burnt. And the Bible says that they settled in Africa. We have Cush, Mizraim, and Canaan. Egypt is actually named after Mizraim, okay? And then we have Shem. The Bible says that Shem also lived in Africa. And if we go down Shem's descendants, we find that one of them who is very significant to Bible history is named Abram. And as you know, he later gets a name change. He gets upgraded to Abraham. I want you to look at the Zondervan's Bible Dictionary. And we're going to zero in and find out if we are now the descendants of Ham or the descendants of Shem. The Zonovan Bible Dictionary says Ham, the youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood, and one of the eight persons to live through the flood, he became the progenitor or father of the dark races, but it says not the Negroes. You know, coming up in America, we had a lot of names that we were called by. One of the names that we were traditionally known by is Negro. We are still known by that, depending on who you're talking to. But this Zondervan Bible Dictionary says that even though Ham was the father of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Libyans, and the Canaanites. So what did the Zondervan Bible Dictionary know about us? that we didn't know about us, if Ham covers the black races, but not us. So let's take a little further. So Negroes are not from the line of Ham. So that means that the only thing left is the line of Shem. If we look at the line of Shem, it comes all the way down to Abram, who later on God changes his name to Abraham. There was an anthrop anthropologist named Alice Lindsay, and she said, Abraham resembled his sub-Saharan cattle herding Cushite ancestors. 
we call Kushites uh, Sudanese now from Sudan, whose skin tone was from black to reddish brown. Don't you know many of us who they call black are just shades of brown? That's all we are, shades of brown. Some lighter, some darker. His name Abram means high father, man of high estate. The Hittites referred to Abraham as a prince among us, according to the Bible. And then his, the second part of his name was Ham. You know, in Bible, in Bible times, your name meant something. So he is, his, at the end of his name says Ham. It is given a description of him. And Ham in Arabic means burnt. Abraham, if you put the word together, means burnt father, means black father, brown father. The Bible says that God promised to give Abraham a piece of land. Where was that piece of land that Abraham was promised? That piece of land was in part of Egypt, covered half of Saudi Arabia, went all the way over to Iraq and Syria. It covered what is now known as Amman and also Israel, as well as Lebanon. This was the piece of land that God had promised to give Abraham. It is called the promised, what? Land, that's right. So where is the promised land? Where was the land that God had promised Abraham? It was a nation, and the name of the nation was called Israel. Did you know that Israel is actually in Africa? It is in Northeast Africa. Sometimes people say, uh, isn't Israel in the Middle East? If you go back and ask your granddaddy or your great-granddaddy, depending on how old you are or how old he is, you'll find out that the term Middle East is a geographical fiction, meaning they named the place and they called it the Middle East beginning in 1948. Before 1948, it was just Northeast Africa, right? And there it is right there on the tip of Africa called the Horn of Africa or right above the Horn of Africa, we would find uh, Israel. And then what they did is they, they, they dug a, um, a canal called the Suez Canal, and it made it difficult for people to walk from the main continent of Africa to Israel. But prior to then, people were easily able to walk across. This is a man-made canal that was made in the 1940s. So Israel is in Northeast Africa, and based on the landmass, it is correct to call Israelites and descendants of Ham, Africans. All right. So we know that the descendants of Ham were black because Ham means black. It means burnt. Did the Israelites and the children of Ham marry? Right? The Bible says in Judges 3, verses 5 and 6, And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Parasites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and they took their daughters to be wives and gave their daughters to be sons and served their gods. According to the Bible, they intermarried for close to 400 years. Matter of fact, the children of Israel all married women who came from this part of the world, except for Joseph, who buries an Egyptian. So you have brown people intermarrying with brown people for 400 years. Let's see if there are some clues to help us be identified based on what the Bible tells us about us. The Bible says that they had physical characteristics. I've already told you about the hair makeup and the skin color. I've talked to you about the location of origin. The Bible says that we were slaves in Egypt. The Bible says that we had a name of our deity or our God, and that name was matched up with our people. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. So our name had something to do with his name. Let's take a look. The Bible also suggests and history suggests that these people studied from a holy book called the Torah, a holy book. The Torah makes up the first five books of our Bible. First five books is our Bible called the, the book of Moses. This was a book that these people were famous for having and to have written. They were also able to be identified because they kept a holy day known as Sabbath. They also repeatedly were put into slavery as part of their curses. 
and their original language was Aramaic. Well, did they look like Egyptians? The Bible says that Joseph and Moses looked like an Egyptian. It says that when Joseph was in Egypt, that he knew his brothers, but they didn't know him. When they came to Egypt, he looked just like the Egyptians. Joseph became a ruler or a prince in Egypt. Moses was also a prince in Egypt. And Moses and, and Joseph, both of them, were, were, were living in Egypt at some point, and God brings them out. And the reason God says he brings them out in Psalms 105.45 is that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. What did they call him? What did they call God, these people? They called him Yah. They called him Yah. That was the name that they called him. And Psalm 68, verse 4, it says, Sing unto God, sing his praises to his name, and extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Yah. Right? So in some of your Bibles, you'll see a J, and it says Ja. Right? For those of you who are from Jamaica, who got parents from the Caribbean, you've heard that term before. If you ever heard of Bob Marley, he always talks about Yah. And he says, and they rejoice before him. But if you look through the Bible, you see these names over and over again. It's Obadiah, Zechariah, Isaiah. And you even see it in Hallelujah. When slaves came to America, they knew a word and a song, and the song was Kumbaya. They would sing Kumbaya, my Lord. And the people wondered, how did these slaves all across America know this song? And nobody taught it to them. And the slave masses didn't know what it meant. It simply says, come by here, Lord. Right? So they all spoke this same language, even though they came from different parts of Africa. And we know that Yah did not have a J in it because J is the last letter of the, the English alphabet. It wasn't created to the 1600s. So Yah was a name that he identified his people by. And many of the early slaves, when they checked the slave registries, they had these same names, right? Not just Kunta Kente. They had a lot of names that ended with Yah, Obadiah, Zechariah, Isaiah. These were the names of many of the early slaves. Why does that matter? When Jesus came, his mother called him Yahshua, Yahshua. And Yahshua means savior. Its English translation is Joshua. And we find in the Bible that Joshua was called the captain of the host or leader of the armies of Israel. There's also another person in the Bible named Joshua. We find him in Ezra and he's a priest. Those are two titles that, that Christ held. Christ was called captain of the Lord's army. We see in Revelation chapter 19, he comes riding in on a white horse at the captain of the host in front of God's army. And his mother would have called him Yahshua, not Jesus. Remember I told you J is a relatively new letter to the alphabet. So she would have called him Yahshua, right? Which means God saves. So names matter. The Bible talks about our name and I'll come there in a minute. The Bible says that these people who lived in Northeast Africa, they would not follow the laws and statutes of God. Matter of fact, these people who were called by his name, God sent his son, Jesus, or Yahshua, to them, and they turned him over to the Roman government, and they said, crucify him. And they said that his blood would be upon us and our children. And sure enough, the Romans killed many of them in AD 70. And when they fled from Israel, they went to different parts of Africa. The Bible says that Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles, that's the Romans, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So these Hebrew Israelites fled from Northeast Africa to West Africa to escape the Romans in AD 70. So when they went running out of Israel, where did they go? According to a book by Rudolf Windsor, called Babylon to Timbuktu, that when these, these Black people who were in Israel fled from affliction under the Roman government, they headed through Egypt, which is where they always went when they had 
trouble and strife. And from Egypt, many of them went to West Africa. From West Africa, many of them became slaves and ended up in North America, in the Caribbean, and in South America as part of what's, what's commonly known as the transatlantic slave trade. A bunch of them also went to Yemen, Ethiopia, and South Africa. If you look at your Bible, you'll see yourself right in the beginning of the Bible, in the Christian era, in the Christian era. In Acts 13, verse 1, it says, Barnabas, who was called Niger, at least that's the way people want to pronounce it some days, but it's spelled N-I-G-E-R, right? And if you go to, if you go to a concordance online, and you find where this word is listed and you hit the button, it sounds differently. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. It doesn't sound like Niger. And it says that these men, if you look at the early people who started the church, you have Paul and Barnabas and Simeon. So Barnabas was called Niger, right? And the way it's pronounced in the, in the dictionary or in the concordance, is the same way that you pronounce another word. We call it the N-word. I would say it. Don't have a problem saying it. But I want y'all to understand the Bible says that our name was going to become a reproach. It was going to become a byword or a cuss word, our name, because we had turned our back on God. Paul, who was another one of the early founders of the church, he wrote 13 books of the Bible. One day he was stopped by a Roman officer and a Roman officer said to him, art not thou that Egyptian? Why did they think Paul was an Egyptian? Because Paul looked like an Egyptian. He had the skin color of an Egyptian. He had the hair of an Egyptian, right? Moses also was brown skin. We know that. Uh, so these are just some of the early founders of the Christian church, what they may have looked like. These people that the Romans called N-I-G-E-R, <laughs> they settled on a river and the river was called N-I-G-E-R, right? They pronounce it Niger River. They settled in this area and it, be called, it, became, it began to be called Nigeria, which means Niger area. Are you with me? N-I-G-G-E-R area. It means land of black people, right? Off the Black River or Brown River is where these people were set up. And while they were there, they set up the largest library in the history of the world. It was called Timbuktu. You ever heard of Timbuktu? It was the largest library in the world. And this is what it looked like. It was full of books. We used to be known as people of the book. We did nothing but read all day. We read God's books. Most of these people spoke a language called Bantu. They still exist all across Africa. And these Bantu people, they were killed by Muslims because they kept the seventh day Sabbath as required by the fourth commandment. The Muslims also identified them as people of the book. Bible means the book, it means library. The Bible is a library of 66 books. There used to be some more in there that disappeared, but it's a library. They used to read the Holy Scriptures every Sabbath. It was their custom handed down from Moses. When the Arab slave trade that started a thousand years before the slave trade that brought us to America, the Muslims also called the Negroes of Western Sudan Yahudi, Yahudi, which means the lost tribes of Israel. Remember I told you God's name is Yah, God's name is Yah. His people were called Yahudi or Yahudim, right? So here we again, here we go again, seeing ourselves in this Bible, right? When the Arab Muslims informed the Portuguese about the people of the book, they said that they were a people cursed by God and predestined to be slaves. Do you know that's actually in the Bible? Deuteronomy 28. In Deuteronomy 28 are the blessings and the curses. This is what Moses told the children of Israel what happened to them. First, they would get blessings if they kept God's law, and if they didn't, they would get curses. The very last of these curses says that if they didn't keep God's law, that they were going to be sent as a nation into slavery on ships. Do you know that we are the only nation in the history of, world, of the world 
that got sent as a whole group of people, close to a hundred million of us were taken from Africa on ships. Many of us died in the transatlantic slave trade, but we still here, we still here. All right, so these were some of the signs to look for to help us identify ourselves. I talked about the physical characteristics, the location, slaves in Egypt, the name of our people, what we read, and then the Sabbath day. Let's talk about some of the curses in our original language, okay? The Bible says that your name was going to be a byword, an object of general reproach, derision, and scorn. It says in Deuteronomy 28, it's 36 and 37, and thy name shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword. That means a negative word wherever you went. It says, among all the nations, whither the Lord shall lead thee. The byword, if you go to concordance, is N-I-G-E-R, right? This is the word that, that we were called in Acts chapter 13. And, and it is pronounced the same way as N-I-G-G-R if you hit the pronunciation button in the concordance. Are you following me? This word, N-I-G-E-R, is the word that the Romans used that was synonymous with the Israelites who lived in Judea. N-I-G-E-R means nothing more than black Israelite. <laughs> N-I-G-G-E-R is a Hebrew Israelite is now a curse word or an offensive term. We have no knowledge of our history. Most people prefer to call us a Negro. Now, where did the term Negro come from? If they said that we came to America and we were Negroes, did we come from Negro land? Well, actually we did. This is a map, a 1747 map done by Emmanuel Bowen. Emmanuel Bowen was a map maker from many of the kings of Europe. And in this map, if you can see, is it a map that he drew and it's called the map of Negro land. That's literally the section that he called this place on the map. And Negro land is what you now call West Africa. I'm gonna zero in on this map of Negro land and if I zero in close enough, you will see kingdom, it says KM, that's abbreviation for kingdom of Judah, kingdom of Judah. So the people who the Romans ran out of Judah and Jerusalem in AD 70, resettled here in West Africa. And what did they call their kingdom? The kingdom of Judah. This is right on what is now known as the slave coast right? Because this is where they took many of the people who ended up in slavery. These are the curses that the Bible says in Deuteronomy 28 would fall upon these people for failure to follow God's laws, statutes, and commandments. You tell me if these sound familiar to what you have experienced and what you know about our people. It says that we will be perpetually in slavery and captivity. Check. We will have no power to stand against our enemies. Check. We will be sent back to Egypt again by ships. Now, the Bible says that we will be sent by Egypt. Egypt means bondage. We were sent from literal Africa to America for our bondage. And that's what Egypt means. So were we sent here to, from, from Africa to America for our bondage? Check. We were exiled in the land of our enemies. Check. <laughs> Scattered among the nations, check. You can go around the world and find us by our skin complexion and the, the grade of our hair. We are a very sick and diseased people, check. Bottom of the, the rung socially, check. Other races will rise above us, check. We lost the true knowledge of who we are. We're the only people in history who don't know who we are. They had to give us a month just to figure out who we are. And when we study Black History Month, it only goes back to slavery. You mean to tell me that this great people, the only thing you know about us is we've been slaves? The Bible says that would happen. Lose true history of ourselves. The Bible says that we would be packed into prisons and jails. Check. We will be a non-prosperous people. Check. An oppressed people. Check. The Bible also says that we will be very religious and members of all religions. Check, check, check. We are the most religious people on the planet. When they took us into slavery, they created slave bills. These are like flyers, you know, billboards for slaves. And it says to be sold on board the ship, and it gave the ship name, 
and it says a choice cargo of about 350 fine, healthy, and they called them Hebrews. Hebrews. Do you know that, that Abraham was called a Hebrew? His descendants were also known as Hebrews. So what they called us on these original slave trade, slave um, ships were Hebrews or Hebrews. And later on, they called us Negroes. Those two terms were synonymous. So the earliest uh, slave bills, Negroes, Ebus, Igbus, Hebus, all pronounced Ebus or Ebus or Igbu, right? The etymology of where the word comes from, from Igbu, is Eber, Emu, Eber, which we find in Genesis 10, 21, which is where we get the term Hebrew. Eber is the ancestor of Abraham. The Igbu people speak Aramaic, which is the language which preceded Hebrew as the language spoken by the Israelites. Aramaic, they say, is a dead language. But guess who still speaks Aramaic? Across Africa, it is spoken, and it is commonly called Bantu. It is still spoke up, spoken of. And some of, the, some of the girls, if you talk to them, they'll tell you, that, that when the girls braid their hair in a certain way, it's called a Bantu knot, right? So we still use a lot of the same hairstyles that our ancestors used. They also took away their names and their language. Remember uh, Roots with Kunta Kente and they beat him until he said that his name was Toby. So they took away their names. The Bible says that they were stripped of their names and they were given their slave master's name. Like I'm Thomas Felder. My people were probably on the Felder plantation. Are you with me? This is not my original name. We were branded with hot iron on the initials of our master. We were branded, which is why many of y'all want name brand stuff. Because we have been so indoctrinated that we are more valuable with somebody's brand on us. We'll die for Nikes or LeBrons or this or that. Because we used to be in branded. The Bible says that most of the men did not shave their faces. When they were put into slavery, they shaved their faces because they didn't want them to look like lions. We looked fierce. We looked strong. And they, they took it away from them, right? It says it made it illegal for them to learn how to read. And it outlawed their language, their religion, and their keeping of the seventh-day Sabbath. Well, the Bible says that they were going to be sold into Egypt on ships. It says that in Deuteronomy 28, 68, the word Egypt means bondage. And the Lord shall bring them into Egypt again with ships. By the way whereof I spake unto them, thou shalt see it no more again, meaning that you will not see your homeland ever again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. They turned them into slaves. America is modern day Egypt. If you look in the back of a dollar bill, there's the Egyptian pyramid. This is a famous monument of Martin Luther King. It is an identical monument to Tut Moses III. That is the, that is the Pharaoh that they believe is the one who was ruling Egypt when we were there as slaves. They got, they got Abra, um, Martin Luther King in front of the same monument as the guy who enslaved us. Isn't that funny? This is a picture of what they said Jesus looked like before we went into slavery. Before 1492, this is what the picture of Jesus looked like. This is an iconic picture of Jesus in Europe. You will still find that in Russia. After slavery, Pope Alexander VI changed what, what the picture of Jesus looked like because as he sent people out to enslave these Africans, the people would not enslave them because the people look like the picture of Jesus. How do you enslave somebody who looks like your God? So the Pope Alexander VI commissioned the Ninja Turtles, right? Not the real Ninja Turtles, but their names were Donatello, Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci. He commissioned them to whitewash all of the famous pictures of Jesus across Europe. And he went like he went from looking like this to looking like this after the slave trade began. In fact, Pope Alexander VI had his son sit for a painting uh, that was done by Michelangelo. And this is the picture of Pope Alexander VI's son 
that became now known as the picture of Jesus. This is a relatively new thing. Many of our people have turned their back on Christianity, believing it was the white man's religion. You know, the devil is slick, ain't he? He's slick. Early on, when slavery began in America in 1810, there was a bunch of Israelites who had settled in America. They were called the Free Blacks of Israel Hill, right? This is right up here in, in Virginia. And it talks about that these Israelites and other free African-Americans worked as farmers. They were called Israelites by even former slave owners. Owners. So here it is. After seven slaveries, hopefully this time we get it right. The Bible says that we were repeatedly in slavery. We went into slavery with a nation called Egypt. We went in slavery with a nation called Assyria. We went into slavery with a nation called Babylon. We went into slavery with a nation called Media Persia. We went into slavery with a nation called Greece. We went into slavery with a, a nation called Rome. Rome became papal Rome and the papacy put us in slavery again. Don't you know the first slave ship that came to America, its name was the good ship Jesus? Isn't that something? They put us on a slave ship named Jesus. The Bible says that God has put them into a deep sleep. And to this day, he has shut their eyes so they do not see. And they have closed their ears so they do not hear. This is found in Romans chapter 11. And it says, now if the Gentiles were enriched because the people of Israel turned down their God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world would share when they finally accept it. We as a people have turned our back on God. We have watched movies like Black Panther and now we, we pray to dead ancestors. The Bible says that a people should not turn from a living God to worship the dead. You find that in Isaiah 8, verses 19 and 20, right? So we have found that we have turned our back on them, and many of us think that we are God. Moses, when he had grown up, the Bible says, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded the disgrace from the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt. And the Bible says, by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. So here's the real deal. Now that we've gone through a quick history of your people, and, I, and, and if you go back to that movie that I watched as a kid, and I was trying to decide who to root for because I wanted to root for somebody who looked like me, and I was trying to choose between the Egyptians and the Hebrews, guess what? They both look like me. But when I study the Bible and I know true history, I find that these Hebrews are the ones who ended up in slavery and ended up here in America. And many of us can trace our roots right back to Moses. So I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Hopefully you learned something and hopefully I got you beginning to think a little differently about your Bible and who you are and where you are in history. You are important. You are valued. And I want you to know that this Bible is a story about you and what we've been through as a people. So as you enjoy Black History Month, my name is Thomas Felder. I thank you for allowing me to be here. And I want to tell you that our people one day will be free. We are going to push until something happens. That's your motto, push, man. Push, push stands for pray until something happens. And God says that he will redeem us. He will redeem his people. We do have a chance to be saved, all of us, all of us. It's not limited to our color. It's not limited to where we came from. It's not limited to our race. But the reason I share this information with you is that sometimes we don't realize that that book, Bible is a history book about us. So hopefully now that you'll see the Bible a little differently and you'll be inclined to go and see and, and find yourself in that book. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your kindness towards us. I pray that you watch over Pine Forge, watch over the students, the teachers, the deans. Keep them safe, Father, and watch over them until you come again. We ask these and so many more blessings in your holy son, Jesus, Yahshua the Christ. Amen, amen, and amen again. 
Thank you so much, everybody, for having me here for Black History Month. I'd love to come back and talk to you again. My name is Thomas Felder. I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom. What would it profit us to gain the whole world and to lose our own soul? So until I meet you and greet you, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Today's presentation is officially over. Take care.